I'm Glenn Kaiser, the director of the Dolby Institute, and we're kicking off a series of podcasts on a variety of topics having to do with sound and sound for film. And I'm really excited uh, that today we, uh, we're launching this uh, podcast series here at Skywalker Ranch, and we're talking with Randy Tom, the director of sound design at Skywalker Sound. And it's a pleasure to be here, Randy. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Well, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. It's true. I actually, uh, in full disclosure, uh, I ran Skywalker Sound for about eleven years, uh, and so it's it's actually it's it's nice to be back. So I know Randy well. We worked together quite a bit uh, over the years. Uh, Randy uh, obviously needs no introduction from me, but uh, for those two or three of you who might not be aware, uh, he has a, a very long and illustrious uh, history uh, in the sound business for films. He's worked on movies like Forrest Gump and Despicable Me and The Incredibles uh, and has had a long uh, relationship with Bob Zemeckis, uh, going back quite a ways with uh, amazing movies like Cast Away, and is a multiple Academy Award winner, I believe, uh, twice, right, for yeah. for right stuff. And also, I, it, my recollection is that you're the only person who's actually won an Academy Award for sound for an animated film uh, for The Incredibles. That may is that, be the case. I yeah. think that's right. Yeah. Well, if it's not, somebody will correct us, I'm sure. <laughs> so, Director of Sound Design at Skywalker Sound, um, what what exactly is a sound designer and, and, and what function do they serve on, on the movie? Well, in in an ideal world, the sound designer's job is to help the director figure out what the movie should sound like. Uh, When a director begins working on a film, he or she usually has some vague notion of of what the film may sound like in terms of sound design or music eventually, but the notions usually are pretty vague. And it takes a lot of experimenting and a lot of trying things that don't work in order to figure out in the end what it's actually going to sound like, what the sound style will be, for instance. You know, every movie has a sound style just like it has a visual style. So one of the first questions uh, I ask a director, even after I've uh, read the script, is, you know, what is the sound style you're imagining for this film? Uh, if it's a you know, more or less science fiction film, um, does it need to be realistic or naturalistic as possible in terms of you know sci-fi, or we do, do or do we have the latitude to uh, do all kinds of wild and crazy sounds that may be very stylized and not necessarily seem organic and natural and you know real world sounds. <clears throat> and uh, I think that's often a good place to start because it it allows us to begin talking in concrete terms about what the the sounds and the sound sound styles will actually be. You talked about having that first conversation with the director about what do you want the sound style to be, and I can imagine oftentimes the answer to that question is sort of like a, you know a look to you and like uh. I think it's very hard for directors to talk about sound, and often they may not know what they have in mind. So how do you how do you approach that situation? What, what what's what's how, how do you deal with it? Especially working with the you you do work from time to time with with younger first time directors mm-hmm. who may not know how to articulate what they want. Yeah. Well, one of the big problems, <clears throat> probably the biggest problem with sound in film is that writers and directors, and in fact all of us, tend to think in visual terms and in terms of dialogue when we think of telling stories and and telling film stories. For some reason, it's it's just not natural, I guess, for the human brain to think analytically about sound. Obviously, music is a bit of an exception to some degree, and there's a long history of reasons for that. But if you set you know, classical music uh, aside, and classical music as it applies to movies, uh, there really is very little tradition for thinking in depth about and describing sound. And even composers will tell you that uh, the language barrier between uh, them and the and the director of the film is is huge. Uh, in some ways, they say they would rather talk to a director who doesn't know much about music because if the director knows a lot about music <laughs> and music terminology, it tends to get way too specific too soon and mm. kind of straightjacket what they can do. Interesting. 
But very often the best place to start is by talking about specific examples of films. Um, if, if it's a film that involves some kind of fantasy or sci-fi or otherworldly uh, behavior, you can say, well, is it, is it more like uh, Star Trek or more like Harry Potter <laughs> that you have in mind? So uh, on a film like Star Trek, uh, you have a lot of latitude to use you know, artificial sounds, electronically generated sounds. But uh, when you're conjuring uh, magic spells for uh, Harry you, Potter, as you've done, as I did, <laughs> it's not going to sound right if it sounds artificial. It has to sound natural. And so uh, if the director says, oh, yeah, it's much more kind of organic, it has to be like a, a Harry Potter world that we create, then I know that. Uh, in terms of manufacturing sounds and finding sounds that are appropriate, I'm going to have to use natural, real, organic sounds. So a spell will be made, you know, a wand flash will be made from elements like thunder. Uh, the fizz of the splash of the, of the flash may come from uh, Alka-Seltzer hmm. or, you know, something from the real natural world. And, and, and is, is there a reason why, you know, obviously in, in the visual world with visual effects, we've developed amazing technology for creating synthetic, synthetic images. But that doesn't seem to be the case with sounds. Do you, why, why do you think that is? I think it's because sound itself is so malleable and our perception of sound is so malleable that we haven't had to. Um, it, it, I think it became evident very early in the history of filmmaking that you couldn't um, film um, a lizard <laughs> and very convincingly <laughs> turn that lizard into a dragon right. uh, that would do the kinds of physical things that you needed the dragon to do visually in the story that you're telling. And so an enormous amount of uh, R&D was put into, um, even in, you know, long before the days of digital arrived, into trying to figure out how you could create visual images that, of things that don't exist in the real world that you could manipulate in any way you want to manipulate them. On the other hand, sound and our perception of sound is so malleable uh, that we've been able to get away uh, until now with not having to electronically synthesize uh, real world sounding things because we can go out and record uh, an elephant and a whale and a tiger and manipulate those sounds in a way that um, is still very believable but amplifies the sound, the, the volume, the mass of that creature um, maybe by a factor of 10 and adds a kind of variety to its vocalizations that might not exist in, in the real world and audiences, uh, will completely buy it. <clears throat> I think we are quickly running out of ways to, to manipulate pigs and <laughs> horses and cows and bears and dogs and cats, etc. cetera. Uh, and so I think the need is going to become more and, and more evident to be able to electronically simulate, generate uh, creature vocalizations. Um, but we're not quite there yet. We don't absolutely have to yet mm -hmm. because we still have enough tools in our pockets to allow us to... Uh, to fake it for a while longer. <laughs> so when a new project comes in, <clears throat> what's, what's, what's your approach? Kind of how do, how do you go about the work of creating the sounds uh, for a film? Um, and, and at what point in the filmmaking process do you like to get involved? I like to get involved as early as possible. I you know, wrote, wrote this article uh, back in the early 90s called Designing a Movie for Sound. Uh, that's used in, in the curriculum of quite a few uh, universities these days. I we, see you have, have it there. We have, we have a copy right here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I better watch what I say. You can uh, check me there. 
Um, and uh, the, the essential point of the article is that it's not enough just to design cool sounds or beautiful sounds or scary sounds um, for a film. The film itself, or at least scenes within the film, need to be designed with sound in mind. Uh, I, and I arrived at that conclusion after looking at and listening to lots and lots and lots of movies that use sound extraordinarily well and deciding that it wasn't just a function of how good the sound designer was or how cool or powerful the sounds were, because I heard cool and powerful sounds in films that didn't use sound particularly well. Mm -hmm. uh, I realized that it had to be the design of the scene itself that opened the door to use sound well. So I decided then and there that I wanted to get involved in films as early as possible, ideally at least during the rewriting of the script, uh, when you know an initial script has been done, uh, either written by the director or, or a screenwriter, and the director is in the process then of revising it, you know, often working with the screenwriter to um, to come closer to what is actually going to be a shootable script. And at that point, I can look at the script and I can say to the director and potentially the writer, uh, you know, if, if you change this thing about this scene, it would allow me to do something really interesting with the sound that would connect to a sound that we're going to hear later in the film, but hear it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And my experience is that the directors are extraordinarily open to to hearing things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, there's been a kind of taboo about sound people uh, making any suggestions about the way something should look or mm -hmm. the way something should, a scene should be designed. But I think we've, we sound people have worried needlessly about that to a great degree. And I think any director worth his or her salt wants to hear any idea that anybody has that might actually help the film because in the end, you know, the director is going to get most of the credit or the blame <laughs> anyway. So they'd be a fool not to listen to what could be a potentially good idea. And uh, production designers, art directors, cinematographers constantly have these kinds of discussions very early on with directors about how the film should look. They'll, they'll say, you know, if we had the characters enter the building through the other side instead of the way, you know, through the side door instead of the way it's described in the script as the front door, that would help us once we get inside with the way it's going to look so-and-so, et cetera. And so why shouldn't sound people be involved in, in similar discussions? And I'm all for movies actually being collaborative. Right. Um, you know, we often say movies are a collaborative art form, but very often what tends to happen, unfortunately, is that you have several departments who are kind of marching more or less in the same direction, but not talking to each other mm -hmm. nearly enough. And, and everybody feels that they're 100% responsible, as you write, for yeah. the success of a particular sequence or scene. Yeah, yeah. The the composer feels like uh, he or she is 100% responsible for the scene working, sometimes because the director tells them they are. And very often the same director will come to me and say, um, you know, you're – sound design is so crucial to the scene working, you know, you really need to bring, you know, every uh, element you have to the table to make it work, having just come from the composer and told the <laughs> composer the same thing. And so we show up, uh, you know, the, the, the two sound department heads show up at the mix with our full arsenal of sounds and you put all of the faders up on the mixing console and it sounds like you're standing next to Niagara Falls because you, every right. bit of ammunition is firing at the same time. And so you go through this agonizing process typically that takes a, a day or two of trying to make something coherent out of what is essentially a wall of noise for 10 or 15 minutes. And it's mostly a process of getting rid of things, you know, seeing what you can afford to lose and what you really need to focus on sonically. So uh, what I hope to do by getting involved as early as I can is to avoid that, mm -hmm. uh, to encourage the director and the screenwriter to think very specifically about 
how sound is likely to be used, musical sound and sound design in a scene, and how those decisions will affect decisions about blocking the scene in terms of the actors, where the actors are going to be at any given time, about how much dialogue is going to be in the scene, because you really need some spaces, some mm -hmm. holes in the dialogue, not only for the audience to hear the sound in this place where the scene is happening, but I think more to the point is that the characters in the scene near need to hear the way that place sounds mm -hmm. because I think the way that sound design is most powerful is when it gets channeled through the characters in the film to the audience. When the audience feels, whether they realize it or not, when they get the impression that what they're perceiving sonically is what the characters in the scene are perceiving, somehow the emotion gets amplified. Interesting. It, so if, 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 the, if the audio track is representational of what the characters are experiencing, um, then that becomes a very powerful experience. Yeah, absolutely. The yeah. The, a lot of this for me begins with Apocalypse Now, partly because it was the first film I ever worked on. I was, well, through, I was going to ask, how did you, I mean, did, did you, did you aspire to be a sound man from, from your <laughs> early childhood? Uh, I didn't, uh, <laughs> I, I did not have a calling to, uh, to preach the gospel of sound <laughs> until much later. And I was in public radio. I, uh, was a production director at a couple of public radio stations, which meant that I was just kind of in charge of the using of equipment and would go out and record uh, and engineer live broadcasts of music. And, and I designed sounds for a few radio plays. Then in the mid seventies, I decided I wanted to try to wheedle my way into movie sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, after about a year or so of a lot of frustration, knocking on doors that got politely closed in my face, uh, I made you know, maybe the luckiest phone call in my life and uh, somehow got Walter Murch's phone number. And he, <laughs> he uh, for some bizarre reason, hired me to work on Apocalypse Now, essentially as one of his assistants. And so that was my film school. I certainly didn't go to film school, but uh, I had the best film school you could possibly have, which is spending you know, about a year and a half on, on Apocalypse Now, where just about anything that could have gone right or gone wrong <laughs> did. Uh, so it was an amazing catbird seat to be in, to watch this process. You know, these you know, geniuses, you know, Coppola and, and Merch and Storaro and all the others, um, interact with each other. Uh, and I was an assistant in the mix. And so I, and the mix went on for nine months. So I sat there Amazing. in the mix for nine months, uh, watching this. So, you know, how could there be a better film school <laughs> right. than that? I, I'm just amazed at, you know, the, the, if you spend any time in Northern California with sound folks, just the, the, the gravitational pull of apocalypse is, is undeniable. There's so many people who, got started on that film or it really shaped their careers in a way. And uh, I, I was at uh, Telluride uh, Film Festival last year for the, oh gosh, one of the anniversaries. I can't remember which big anniversary it was. And they showed the film and, uh, and I hadn't seen it in a few years. And it was just a, it was still extraordinary to me um, how well crafted. It's, uh, you know, it's still one of the best tracks I think that's ever been done for for a, a motion picture. So you were saying that, that a lot of your, your approach to thinking about writing with sound started with Apocalypse. So can you talk more about that? Yeah. I, I think if Apocalypse were released brand new today, uh, it would be a huge splash in terms of sound. Um, and you know, I think you're absolutely right. It, it holds up amazingly well. I, I think that one of the keys to using sound well in a film story is often point of view, figuring out how to use the point of view of one of the characters or how to express the point of view of the filmmaker uh, by using stylized visuals and stylized sound, etc. And I think the key creative decision on Apocalypse uh, 
was when Coppola decided he wanted to tell the story very much through the point of view of these young American soldiers in, in Vietnam. The script that John Milius had written originally uh, was you know, a really good script. It contained a lot of the iconic uh, language uh, that we love in the film, like I love the smell of napalm in the morning. That, that was in the original Milius script. Mm -hmm. But uh, stylistically, you'd have to say it was a much more kind of conventional, traditional storytelling uh, approach than... At the script stage. At the mean. script stage mm -hmm. than... And Coppola has, has said as much, and I think Milius would probably uh, say as much too. And at some point... Um, in the many versions of the script and revisions of the script that were done, uh, Francis decided that it had to be clearly the point of view of these young soldiers uh, and principally the point of view of Captain Willard, the Martin Sheen character. And, you know, in, in the beginning of a film, uh, in the first scene or two of a film, one of the things that you're doing is you're, you're as a filmmaker, is that you're teaching the audience how to listen to the film hmm. and how to watch the film. And for that reason, and also for the reason that in the beginning of a film, there are lots of question marks hanging in the air about what's going to happen, who are these characters, et cetera. And, and the audience is willing to do that for the first 10 or 15 minutes of a film yeah, to absolutely. exist with that ambiguity. Yeah. Right. So beginnings of films are often where a lot of the most interesting sound experimentation is done. Uh, in Apocalypse Now, the sound experimentation runs throughout the film, but I'd say there's probably even more in the beginning than there is later on. And as I say, it's partly because you're, you, you are, in a sense, teaching the audience how to listen. So the first thing you experience in Apocalypse Now is a sound uh, before there's any visual image. It's this kind of ghostly, synthesized, helicopter mm -hmm. thumping sound that you hear, if you're lucky enough to hear it in uh, a multi-channel movie theater, you hear g fly all around you in the theater. <clears throat> and one of the jobs that I had on Apocalypse Now was to uh, actually go out and record things like helicopters. And so the first time I was sitting in the mix and heard that synthesized helicopter, at first I have to say I was uh, a little hurt. <laughs> <laughs> they changed your recording. Because <laughs> I'd been out recording these real helicopters, and I was thinking, why is Walter putting this uh, weird uh, electronically synthesized helicopter into the very opening of the film? And, but it didn't take me very long to realize it was exactly the right decision because what you're experiencing there in the beginning of that film is Captain Willard's mind working. Mm -hmm. uh, he's drunk in this uh, hotel room in Saigon, in Saigon. <laughs> right? <laughs> remembering... Uh, terrible things that he's witnessed in, in the various battles that he's been in. He's hallucinating. He's and probably his, taken all kinds of drugs. His mind is back in the jungle. Yeah. And so um, you aren't really listening to reality. You're listening to his brain function in a way. So that kind of very stylized, synthesized, electronic kind of sound was perfect to tell you you know, we're in a very weird space here because mm -hmm. we're inside this guy's head. And then, of course, a couple of minutes later, uh, he is lying in his bed in the, in the hotel room looking up at the ceiling fan. And instead of hearing whatever sound that ceiling fan might be making, we hear a helicopter, right. a real helicopter, the rotors of a real helicopter. And so once again, we're listening to his brain operate. And I think it's one of the most powerful metaphors mm -hmm. uh, in, in film history, that, that shot of him, of his, his literal POV looking up at the ceiling fan and thinking, you know, helicopter, I wish I was back there mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. 
in the jungle. And so this goes very much to, you know, the idea that writers should be thinking, screenwriters should be thinking more in these kinds of terms when they're writing screenplays, because uh, obviously metaphors are one of the principal tools that writers right. use, no yeah. matter what form they're writing in. And using sound, using sound design in a metaphorical way that will relate to uh, visual images um, kind of obliquely but still powerfully is kind of a vast territory that's largely unexplored in, in movie writing. Well, I, I, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, I think, you know, because of the um, amazing work that, that you and, and, and others in our business have done, there's a great appreciation for what sound design can do for, you know, animated films, for, for big visual effects films. But I'm, I'm curious, you know, what you say to, you know, oftentimes uh, a young writer director working is going to be on a very limited budget and say, you know, young writer director is, is they've got a script that they've written and it's, it's, uh, it's largely comedic and it's happening among a handful of characters in, in, in an urban environment. And I, I, Oftentimes, I'll have a conversation with a director working on a picture like that, and they say, "Well, you know what? My movie is very simple. It's it's dialogue and maybe some music. So, what you know, what role does sound design play? You know, in a, in a picture like that? I'd say uh, watch some Coen Brothers movies, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I, I know you're a fan of the Coens, and and I am too. I've always been very jealous of Skip uh, Leavesay. Uh, getting to to do sound design on all those wonderful movies. And uh, Barton Fink is an example that I often use, uh, specifically the the scene in Barton Fink where the title character walks into the to the hotel the hotel <laughs> lobby and rings the bell and rings the bell. Yeah. Uh yeah, he walks into this large dimly lit hotel lobby where there's He's the only person there. There's not even a clerk at the desk. And obviously the Coens want to get across the idea that this is a very odd, kind of unsettling place. And I think a less imaginative screenwriter director would have left it up to the music department to, mm -hmm. to convey that idea sonically. But... Uh, the Coens, being you know, the brilliant guys they are, uh, devised a way to use sound design in a very kind of natural but odd way to tell the same story, which is that Barton Fink walks up to the, the clerk's counter and taps the little bell that's there to, to get somebody's attention, and it rings and rings, and <laughs> rings. <laughs> Having just tapped it one time, it rings for, for like, what seems like, a, like, like an a eternity. Minute, right? yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's probably only about 15 or 20 seconds, but it seems yeah. forever. Um, and, uh, and Then, you, then yeah. you hear Steve Buscemi coming up from the bowels of the hotel. Eventually, Steve Buscemi, the clerk, comes up from uh, under the floor through a <laughs> trap door. And you know, the first time you see his face, it always gets a, a great laugh in the theater. I always love that. We just when I play a clip, it, everybody loves that. Mm -hmm. uh, but what a a wonderful kind of organic, natural, beautiful way to tell the audience this is a weird place, right? And this character better watch out in this in this hotel. But uh, you know. We've talked about that scene before, and I, I, I think for for those of us in the business, it's always a it's a, it's a it's a favorite example. But you know, a sound designer can't do that in a vacuum. Uh, to your point, the the Coens, um, and whether they studied it or not, I don't know. I've never had the pleasure of having a conversation with them, but they seem to have an innate understanding of how to write with sound in mind and how to use it as a as a tool. You know, so that that particular you know, gag with the, the long decay on the bell, they had to write it that way. They had to shoot it that way. They had to edit it that way. So that, that was part of what they were doing. Um, and maybe it came out of a conversation with Skip. I don't, I don't know that to, to, uh, to be the case or not be the case. Yeah. But um, in that sense, that was, a, that was a moment that was sound designed by the Coens. Absolutely. Uh, and, and in fact, I think in a really meaningful way, 
most of the great sound sequences in movies have been sound designed by the director. Sometimes it's it's inadvertent <laughs> uh, b- because it's fallen out of other creative decisions that the director made about how things should look. Um, generally, if the director wants uh, a very subjective, stylized look for a scene, uh, some really great sound design doors are opened by that decision alone, even if the director hasn't thought very specifically about the sound. And in fact, uh, Francis Coppola has said that he didn't have a grand plan for the sound in, in Apocalypse Now. He certainly uh, hadn't meticulously worked out how every scene was going to sound, but the very fact that he decided to make it heavily POV, I think, threw open all kinds of wonderful doors that Walter Murch, you know, the genius that he is, walked through in, in grand style and, and took advantage of. But yeah, the I think the big challenge for sound and the big opportunity for sound is all about figuring out how to design movies with sound in mind because it's not a natural way for us to think. Mm -hmm. In a sense, you could say it's about teaching the camera to listen. Um, There's a a sound guy named uh, uh, Aaron Shundry who uh, wrote a piece uh, not long ago about Albert Maisel's, the great uh, documentary filmmaker, Mm -hmm. who did Gimme Shelter and Grey Gardens and lots of other wonderful movies. And uh, he interviewed uh, Albert at one point, and uh, Albert essentially told him that he thought of himself maybe as more of a sound person than a camera person, even though... He you know, was the Albert, shooter, right? Yeah. yeah, he was the shooter. He was the camera operator, and David, his brother, was the ostensibly the sound guy. But very often, uh, when the camera was rolling, uh, Albert would hear a sound coming from you know the other side of the room, and he instead of you know saying cut or you know stopping because they had to get rid of the sound, he would pan over or walk <laughs> over to whatever that sound was. And, you know, feature it for a moment and then pan back to the person who's talking or whatever mm-hmm. the other ostensible action was in, in the scene. And very often that decision is what would really make the scene uh, because in a, in a sense the camera was listening. The camera was aware that there's there are other things going on in the environment that are symbolic, that are representative of what you think the important thing is, but add other layers to it. And I think that's exactly the way that screenwriters and directors should be thinking about sound. You know, the the place is also a character. You know, the place that the scene is happening is, is also potentially a wonderful character that can tell you a lot about, um, who the human characters in the story are if you give it a chance and if you devise a way to, to make that work. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that you bring up the Maisels because you've actually done some uh, work in documentary as well, working with Errol Morris. And, and I, I'm also really interested in that conversation about what is the role of creative sound design in, in you know, non-narrative film and, and documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, is, is there room for impressionistic and, and creative sound design when you're telling a, a, a nonfiction story? I think there clearly is. I think attitudes about that have changed a lot over the last uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I think there was a time when the majority of documentary documentary filmmakers would have said, you know, if the sound wasn't recorded by the microphone when the camera was rolling, it's not legitimate to use. It's a manipulation. Yeah, right. yeah. These are people who probably didn't put music in their documentaries either. (laughs) A lot of them probably didn't, yeah. But I think there are very few documentary filmmakers with that attitude anymore. You know, when I do talks at at Sundance and and, uh, work with with people who are making documentary films, I, I think the vast majority of them are very much open to the idea of sound design. 
I think partly because they view the old attitude about uh, objectivity, so-called objectivity, in documentaries as being a little bit uh, archaic, uh, and maybe it was misinformed from the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, everything you do when you make a film is uh, a manipulation. Is, an, is right. a manipulation. It's an editorial decision. It's you know, the film is your point of view. Right. You're and telling a story. Yeah, yeah. You're you're whether it's a documentary or not, uh, you're telling a story. Um, it's it's funneled through your consciousness. It has a certain style, has a certain visual style, has a certain sonic style. And so I, I think it's perfectly legitimate to use sound design in almost any documentary film. Yeah. So when you get a script, um, what are you looking for uh, in, in terms of opportunistic moments for you? You, there, you? you wrote in the article, it was very interesting, you wrote in the article, uh, just because a, a script may mention sounds and it doesn't mean that it's a, necessarily a smart script for sound. Yeah, uh, I think you know all of us are are still so naive about how to use sound in storytelling, and that's one of the reasons it's so exciting because it is mostly unexplored territory. But it, we tend to think if a script specifically refers to sounds, it must be a sound friendly script. And in fact, the John Milius script uh, for Apocalypse Now. Uh, did refer to very specific sounds in in the first few pages, but they were um, objective sounds that didn't necessarily relate to the characters in mm-hmm. the way that that you know synthesized helicopter related to the Martin Sheen character. They were just they were descriptions like uh, you know a bird. Sure. A raucous bird is heard uh, at the top from the top of the palm tree, you know, references like that. And so though as sound people we're kind of flattered that the screenwriter is mentioning sound specifically, what gets me and I think most sound designers a lot more excited is if the screenwriter and the director are using POV, playing with time, because time manipulation, you know, flashbacks, flash forwards, mm-hmm. et cetera, are often playgrounds for sound. Um, scenes that involve dreams, memories, hallucinations are always playgrounds for sound design. Um, and I think the black and white, you know, photography. Mm-hmm. Uh, almost always opens interesting doors for sound design. And I think what they have in common, all of these uh, storytelling methods and, and visual approaches, is that they hang question marks in the air. Mm-hmm. They say, here's a mystery for you, person in the audience, to, to help us solve. You know, we don't really quite understand this ourselves we being the filmmakers, you know, you bring your history and your knowledge and your imagination into this. And, and here are some clues that we have, you know, you try to make sense of it. Obviously, if you go too far in that direction, um, you know, it's, if it's too incoherent, if there are too many question marks hanging in the air, people will give up. Mm. But if you supply just enough bait to, (laughs) (laughs) to, uh, tempt them to, to bring their imaginations into it, you know, that's when storytelling is really exciting. Yeah. I want to talk with you for a minute about Castaway. Um, I, th- I think uh, it's a really interesting movie from a sound perspective. Uh, my recollection is, uh, this is obviously the picture directed by uh, Robert Zemeckis with Tom Hanks stuck on the island for, for what happened. The running length of the film, almost half of it, right? Yeah, well, about forty-five minutes. So my recollection was that there were there were rules for the sound on on the island. Can you can you elaborate on that and 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 how how did it make you feel when you when you when you, this sounds like it's every sound designer's kind of dream moment, but it it must also have been a little unsettling when when this came in. Yeah, when Bob Zemeckis told me that there would be, you know, 45 or so minutes of the film 
when the Tom Hanks character is shipwrecked on an island and he's by himself on the island and there would be no music and maybe eight or ten words of dialogue in 45 minutes, uh, I thought I'd gone to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Finally! Right? <laughs> you know. Why was it important that there was no music on the island? Um, you know, I, I, didn't uh, Hitchcock once say when somebody asked him uh, why there was no music in Lifeboat, uh, he said, well, where would the orchestra stand? <laughs> 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 I've never heard that. That's a great quote. That's great. Um, and I think there is, even though it sounds silly uh, when you think about it rationally, I think there is some truth to the idea that music suggests company. Music suggests other people mm -hmm. somehow. Hmm. And... You know, even if it's scary music, you know, there's somebody else there. And Zemeckis wanted the Tom Hanks character to be absolutely isolated. So that he said, not only will there be no music, um, Randy, there will be no insects. No insect sounds no on birds. the island. So no birds, absolutely no birds. <laughs> not even, no seagulls. <laughs> He is the only living thing in That's this right. space. That's right. No frogs. Wow. <laughs> um, and so at that point, I really started to panic. Because <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a really quiet 45 minutes. You're taking every arrow out of my quiver individually. <laughs> so uh, you really want me to create the soundscape that'll you know, be self-sustaining for 45 minutes with only wind and water sounds, mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. and the sounds of his you know, footsteps as he walks around the island. You know, Zemeckis was so adamant about it that uh, you know, it was a live-action film, of course, and when they were shooting, of course, occasionally a fly would fly through the frame, and he had all of the flies digitally removed wow. visually. From the frame. Not so even a fly. Not even a fly. You do see a couple of fish <laughs> <laughs> that the Tom Hanks character catches. Catches, but, yeah. 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 But uh, maybe that was okay because fish don't really make much sound. I don't know. <laughs> well, he had to eat something, right? <laughs> yeah, he had to eat something, yeah. I, so I, I was in kind of a panic for a while, especially because Bob really wanted each scene there on the island and each location on the island to have its own kind of specific sound. So uh, that you would know where you were? And so that you'd know, it would give you a sense of the geography of where you were on the island and also would have a certain mood. Hmm. And, you know, one of the great things about sound is that it's all about emotion. We relate to sound emotionally, not only musical sound, but we relate to the sound of each other's voices emotionally. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, Alan Splett once told me that uh, sound is a heart thing. Alan was mm -hmm. a great film sound designer. Died we used to, way, way we used to work young. with uh, David Lynch, did Eraserhead and a lot of the great David Lynch tracks. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's so true. And though I think that there's no question that we tend to think visually as, as human beings. Uh, I think there's also no question that in terms of emotion, sound is at least equal to visual images in terms of its power to affect us and maybe even superior to visual images mm -hmm. in terms of its power to, to affect the way we feel. And so that's another reason why we just got to figure out, you know, how to use sound better in storytelling. But it's sneaky because you're, it's not working on a conscious level. So Absolutely. as a sound designer, that gives you a, an amazingly powerful tool to, you know, to affect the audience on, a, on an unconscious level. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's, you know, gives the puppeteer a great place to stand where, you know, where he or she won't be seen. So in Castaway... I can um, use a, a, a kind of wind in a particular cove where the Tom Hanks character happens to be sitting one evening that has, 
you know, may, you might call it a kind of musical quality that suggests a kind of melancholy. Mm-hmm. Um, and people will rationally just interpret it as wind. It's a wind. But I know that it's going to have an emotional effect on them. Did you record it that way or was that a, man- a manipulation that you did um, Some in, of in, both. in the cutting room? Yeah, yeah some of both. Um, we, uh, I can, I can imagine you out in the field with your microphone thinking, oh, this is a very mournful wind. I, I'm sure I can make use of this. Yeah. That's how you have to think when you're a, a sound designer. I certainly don't think that way, you know, during every waking hour, <laughs> it's something I can turn on and turn off to some degree, but very often I'll be somewhere and hear a sound and think, wow, that's, I could use that in, in a very creative way, or especially if I manipulated it a little bit. And I did want to ask you that. Do you do you feel like you you move through the world and hear things differently? Sure. Uh, you, as a sound designer, one of the main things you have to teach yourself is to not think literally about right. sounds. You have to think in terms of how the sounds make you feel. And so, when I start working on a film, very often uh, I won't start by making a specific list of. S- sounds that I know are going to be appropriate to every scene. I often start just by listening to sounds in the library more or less randomly. Mm. We have this vast library at Skywalker Sound. And it always happens that I'll hear uh, some sounds, usually only after a few minutes of listening, that will make a some kind of emotional connection for me with something that I've read in the script. Mm. Um, and there are sounds that never would have occurred to me to include in a list of sounds to go find in the library or go out and record because they're, they have no ostensible you know, connection to right. the story. Sure. But I was listening with my, you know, you know, all my emotional feelers out, you know, how does this sound make me feel? How does that sound make me feel? And as soon as one makes me feel the way that I think one of the characters needs to feel in a given scene, I grab that sound and, and figure out how to use it. it. The way you're talking about it, it's – I think for a lot of people, that's they, they presume that that's the role of music. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- there seems to be a really interesting sort of middle zone of sound design also functioning the same role that we would yeah. traditionally think of uh, for music. And you, you mentioned gravity, which I think is a great example of uh, the, the film Gravity, uh, which is a great example of um, music being used in a kind of sound design-y way. Mm-hmm. If you listen to the music in some of those sequences where the pieces of metal are flying through space, you know, ripping through the uh, the spacecraft um, that the two principal characters are in or around, um, there's very little discernible rhythm in the music, uh, very little discernible you know time signature. Mm-hmm. It's all about kind of atmosphere and tone, mm-hmm. and in that sense, it's very much like sound design. And sometimes I think it's difficult to tell in in who did in that film who's you know, who the musician, who the <clears> composer <throat> is, mm-hmm. and who the sound designer is. And I think that's a wonderful thing, and uh, because I think, um, in, in a sense, it makes it all one thing. Do you uh, do you work closely with composers on the on the films that that, that you work on? I try to. It's uh, you always start with good intentions, <laughs> <laughs> and then reality sets in. And then reality sets in. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Walter Murch once said that uh, making movies is a little like uh, uh, commissioning a, a battleship. You you have this battleship, and it's been written down exactly what everybody is supposed to do at any given time, and then the first day out, uh, the battleship is hit by a shell and begins to sink and that's when you really find out who's going to do what <laughs> when the plan goes out the window yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so uh, sometimes despite the best intentions uh, the sound design crew and the music crew don't 
collaborate as much as we should, partly just because very often there's so much work to be done mm. that – you know, I, I know very well that the you know the composer will say yes, absolutely, Randy. We should be you know sending things back and forth to each other, and you know I'll send you my sketches, and you send mm-hmm. me your sketches, and we can compare notes and say, okay, why don't you work in the lower frequency registers, and I'll work in the higher right. frequency right. registers, etc. But I also know that very often that you know the composer is under the gun time wise, just like I am. And uh, he's praying I'm not going to send him anything because he's <laughs> then going to have to take the time to listen to it all. And but when it works, that's but when it works, it's wonderful. And, yeah. and I think you know we we try to make it work. Yeah. So you um, have developed a, a very well deserved reputation uh, for being a great sound designer and mixer for animation. Uh, do you approach? animated films differently than you approach live action films as a sound designer? Not as much as you might think. Mm -hmm. Partly because so many of the live action films that we work on involve so much computer graphics that they might as well be animated. Right. Because you have to start from zero with the sound for all of that anyway because there was no sound. It's photoreal animation as opposed to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it tends to be uh, very different in terms of dialogue work that is live action and uh, because and, all the dialogue and animation. animation is very clean, right? It's very yeah, yeah. All the dialogue recorded for animation, or at least most of it, unless you are you know trying to record some actor who's in some obscure little mm-hmm. place in some part of the world that has a terrible recording studio, and uh, so it's a noisy recording, and you have to try to make that work. But generally speaking. Um, Animation dialogue is well recorded, um, and most production sound for live action films is not very well recorded just because it happens in noisy places. Film sets are notoriously noisy, so it's very difficult to get a great recording of the actors speaking. And in, in live action, then, you have... In a typical scene, you have a sentence or two or three um, that the director insists have to be used from production because the performance is something maybe that the the actor just couldn't duplicate later in ADR. And so you're locked into having to use that, which has a certain amount of background noise behind it. And, and then that dictates what you have to do. And in then terms you have of, to right. make that work with the ADR that fills in the gaps with the other sentences in the same scene. And so it's a big challenge for the dialogue editors and mm-hmm. mixers to make that work. But that bit of noise from the production set also locks you in in terms of sound design to some degree with what you can do because you, um, you're you kind of burdened with this, the you know, the... Uh, the car engines in the background or the fans that were running to make the actor's hair blow mm-hmm. um, in the wind, et, et cetera. And so when I try to create the the atmosphere, the sonic atmosphere, the ambience for that scene, um, I, I have to include some sounds that are more or less like that bit of noise that, that happens in the dialogue. Right. But in terms of sound effects, uh, the approach is strikingly similar. In fact, I think one of the reasons that I got hired early on to do many of the animated films that I worked on is because I had worked so much in live action. And very often, one of the first things an animation director tells me is, I don't want it to sound like a cartoon. You know, I want it to sound like a live action film meaning meaning that they they want the synthetic images to to sit in a very naturalistic i think that's one of their motivations yeah absolutely uh, and though most animation directors really revere the old you know warner brothers cartoon style wiley e. coyote roadrunner that sort of thing that was very stylized in mm-hmm. terms of sound and very you know quote cartoony um it's not something that many contemporary animation directors want to uh, emulate. That's not the style. Yeah, that's and certainly not the style if you if, if, certainly if you're looking at the the the, the, cl- the older classic Disney films, the tracks on those are basically dialogue and music. There's very yeah. little sound effects work. That's right. Yeah, 
Uh, but recently the trend has been toward using more and more sound effects. The, the biggest challenge that I think in most contemporary animated films is I think there's too much dialogue in mm. them. And I think one of the reasons that, that that happens has to do with the way the films are made, which is that... Uh, they record the dialogue first. They, they record the dialogue first. It basically starts as a radio play. Right. Um, and the, the filmmakers are adding some temporary music to the scene that they're working on, adding temporary sound effects to the scene. But oh, the only visuals that you have typically very early on are storyboards. Mm -hmm. So you have basically just still pictures that you're looking at. And so as they're constructing the scene, trying to figure out whether it's eventually going to work as a scene in the movie and make people laugh or cry or tell an interesting piece of the story, um, they rely very heavily on lots of dialogue to explain what's going on. Right. The problem with that then <laughs> is that after they have these beautiful visual images um, and after they have the score, which helps tell the story, and after they have the fully developed sound design, which helps tell the story, they still have all of this dialogue. They're locked in to keeping all of that dialogue right. because they've animated the characters' mouths to it. Yeah. To it. So one of the things, one of the conversations that I always have with animation directors very early on is, you know, are there ways that we can try to avoid that kind of wall-to-wall -wall dialogue effect? And obviously for, for some films, wall-to-wall -wall dialogue is perfectly appropriate. Mm -hmm. But for many, many films, um, it would help enormously, I think, in terms of making them more cinematic if there were at least some scenes with much sparser dialogue. The classic example being the beginning of WALL-E. Mm. Uh, I think, uh, you know, my, my hat is off to Andrew Stanton and, and to Pixar for being brave enough to do what they did with that film, which is have no dialogue uh, for the first roughly half of the film, I right. think. I think Andrew originally wanted to have no dialogue in the whole movie, believe I, it I or not. I remember when I first got the call from Pixar about the film that they were, uh, you know, and they were not at all sure that this was going to work. So they yeah. wanted they, they wanted to hire Ben to come in and do kind of a proof of concept just to see if yeah. they could pull this off. But I remember uh, being on the phone with them and they were saying, yeah, we want to do this film about a you know robot on a you know futuristic kind of earth world and there's no dialogue in the film. And I yeah. just thought, that, that, well, that, that's, that's Pixar swinging for the fences yet again. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the, the tragic thing to me about it is that that's the part of the film that everybody always talks about. That's the part of the film that everybody remembers. And I, th I think that's the part of the film that's the most powerful mm -hmm. in terms of storytelling, but nobody tries to emulate it. Right. Um, right. And, and I guess it's, it's a testament to the fact of how brave it was for them to do it in the first place. But I, I think animation can be so cinematic um, if you don't have you know absolutely wall to wall dialogue that that I just I wish more animation writers and directors would uh, would would try to hit it out of the park like that. Yeah, well, it, it uh, this also leads into another thing I wanted to ask you about, which was <clears throat> you know uh, it was. Animated films largely that that kind of started the trend towards 3D uh, visuals, uh, uh, you know, in in cinema. And I remember having conversations with you with, with clients, you know, when 3D first kind of, kind of came back, uh, because people people kept coming to us and saying, "Well, now we have 3D visuals, so how are you going to up your game, you know, with sound?" And you had a very simple response, which was that we've been doing 3D sound, you For know, 50 years, right? Right. <laughs> 5.1 is 3D sound, mm -hmm. so. But now we actually do have a lot of new technology. There's some interesting new developments in immersive audio. And I would be remiss being from the Dolby Institute if I didn't mention Dolby Atmos uh, as, you know, um, object-based immersive sound. Have you had experience? Uh, what's your experience been with playing with Atmos and how do you feel about it as a storytelling tool? I think it's potentially a great tool. I think that you know, we need to figure out how to use it. Well, you mentioned gravity. I think that that's a great example of you know a first, really solid first step in terms of of using it well. And there you know been several other films that I think have used it well. 
But I think in order to take full advantage of it, um, you need to write for it. You mm-hmm. need to design a scene for it. Uh, one of the problems very often is that scenes are designed sonically so densely and complexly with so many sounds happening at the same time that you can't even tell where sounds are coming from right. in, in the movie theater. And so instead of just having the you know left center and right channels behind the screen full of sound all the time, which is usually a bad idea, you have uh, two or three times that many channels of sound uh, that are full all the time, which is also a bad mm-hmm, idea. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, good sound work, just like good visual work, is all about focus. It's all about figuring out what to focus on at any given time and either subordinating or eliminating everything else that's going to distract you from that important thing to think about in this moment. So a, a well-designed uh, scene for Dolby Atmos, in my opinion, would be one in which you have a character or an object or an event, sonic object or event, that is heard in more or less isolation and moves from you know, one place mm-hmm. in the uh, sonic space to another place in, in the sonic space. And that movement tells you something that you need to know about the story. Right. But unfortunately, the, the way it is now, you know, just like with the rest of sound, uh, we, uh, we don't have a plan <laughs> like that. <laughs> we don't start out with a plan. Mm-hmm. And everything just kind of falls out the way it falls out. And very often it doesn't make any sense visually to try to impose that kind of soundscape. Um, and so your, your hands are tied sonically because right. the scene hasn't been designed for it. Well, and to your point, designing it you know, with, with that immersive technology in mind, I think what doesn't work is for the director to hear – that object based mix, I mean, you know, for the first time on the, on the mixing stage when they've already been living with the film for, you know, a year or whatever, whatever yeah. it's been, you're not going to, that's not going to yield the, the best creative product. Absolutely. So, you know, I think that we need to find ways to uh, at least simulate that kind of sonic environment as, as early as we can in the process. You know, the, the really awful way that sound for movies used to be done. <laughs> Uh, was that the sound editors and the composer were hired, you know, at the last possible minute, typically just, uh, you know, two or three months before the film was supposed to come out. Uh, An army of sound people would work madly, you know, throwing sounds at the canvas. The director and the film's editor meanwhile, have been working for, you know, maybe a year or more, uh, meticulously putting together their much more simple soundtrack, right. sometimes using crude sounds, musical sounds and, and uh, sound effects. And then we, the sound department and the music department, would suddenly, you know, show up and present this mountain of, of sound. New material, yeah. New material that the director and the editor had never heard. And surprise, they hated most of it. Right. Uh, and you, you know, spent an agonizing, you know, several weeks trying to weed out uh, a lot of what you had wasted your time doing. Well, there's a corollary to what you're talking about, which is I remember when I first got to Skywalker and started working with you, uh, there was a period of time with uh, – <laughs> I look back on this very fondly. There was a there was a certain well-known who shall re- remain nameless producer based out of New York, shall we say, uh, who uh, had a great experience working with you and with Skywalker. And suddenly uh, every time he would be working on a film – that didn't test well, uh, suddenly it became the solution is to is to spread the Skywalker sound pixie dust on the film. So we would get these crazy last minute phone calls, uh, you know, with a film showing up that somebody else had actually done the work on, but you had been, you know, tasked with saving the 
film that didn't test well. Yeah. But none of those, you know, it hadn't been conceived. There was no room for you to do, you know, your work. And that was a very, uh, I mean, it was, you know, very lucrative, but not very creatively satisfying way to work. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, finally, a, a a film showed up, and I, I that had basically been finished, and I I was asked by the same person to uh, <laughs> to save it <laughs> with sound design, um, and I you know summoned the courage to say you know I think it's a perfectly good film, and it's not really going to do any good for me to try to shoehorn sound design into this film at this point that wasn't really designed to use sound design in the first place, and so. Uh, as a result, that person never called me again. <laughs> well, there so, you go. So it's, uh, <laughs> I, I can't say, as you say, it was very lucrative, but uh, I can't say that I was too sorry that uh, it turned yeah. out that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, but back to the point of, you know, getting involved early, I think the much more enlightened approach to doing sound for movies that's evolved over the last uh, 10 or 20 years is that you start with a small crew, sound crew, very early uh, in in post production. Very often, as soon as the picture editor starts working on the film, and s- that sound crew is supplying the sounds that the director and the picture editor use in their in the track that they're assembling from the very beginning. And so, instead of going in with the assumption that we, the sound people, are going to throw away this junk that the director and the picture editor have been working on for the last year and put in our superior sounds. Mm-hmm. The the final mix for the film, in a way, begins as soon as the picture editing starts and simply evolves over time and gets refined and grows in, in, in some senses. Uh, over time. So it's an evolutionary process rather than, okay, it's the last minute. Let's throw a lot of sound at it. Well, what, I mean, that seems to make, that seems so obvious. Like, so what's the, what's the counter argument? Why, why do people not do that? Is there, is there a perception that, oh, well, if we start the sound team that early, that'll be too expensive or what, what why, uh, do, why is that not adopted as a? Well, I think it is pretty widely adopted at this point. I think mm. there are, uh, I think there are probably not a lot of people who are using the old approach because I think it makes so much sense. Right. Uh, the thing I wonder is why it started happening the other way uh, in the beginning. You know, some composers don't like getting involved in a film too early um, because um, they rely on the pressure Hmm. of having to do something at the last minute. You know, a lot of artists are procrastinators and, you know, I, I'm there too. I, I, <laughs> I know what they're talking about. And, you know, writers, you know, any, anybody in the arts certainly uh, they need knows that phenomenon yeah. of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to die tomorrow <laughs> if I don't figure out how to make this work tonight. Right. Uh, whereas... You know, last week you don't have that kind of time pressure, and so you can find a million rationalizations for not getting down to brass tacks and actually doing the work. And I've had you know more composers than you might imagine tell me that if they didn't have that time pressure, they don't think they'd be able to to do it. But I got to tell you, I mean, one of the things that I, I learned, you know, watching you work is is the secret is having time to experiment yeah. and try ideas out. And I think you said at the very beginning of the piece, you you make mistakes and you go down blind alleys and you come back and you try different approaches. And if, you know, obviously that's what's sacrificed. If, if, if you literally just leave yourself barely enough time to execute the work before it has to show up on the stage. Yeah. No matter how long you've been doing a craft, uh, you have to make mistakes in order to do anything interesting. You know, very often producers or directors will hire me to work on a given film because they think I already know exactly how to do whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But uh, you never know exactly how you're going to do it because every film is different and has different requirements. Um, There's no kind of rubber stamp that you can apply to, you know, to do film B exactly the same way that you did film A. And so it's going to be easy. And so you have to experiment. You have to make mistakes. Uh, I always say that uh, a great craftsperson knows how to avoid 
mistakes and a great artist knows how to use them. <laughs> you can say the same thing about accidents because mm -hmm. uh, it's almost always the un unanticipated thing that happens, it, which if you have your antennae out uh, in a creative process, you realize, wow, that's, that's the story. Mm -hmm. That's the interesting thing. I never even thought about that. Mm -hmm. And you don't discover that stuff until you're actually doing it, until you're shooting the movie or, you know, and uh, that's the... Uh, in a way, that's the counter argument to planning sound because, you know, any artist knows that it's the serendipitous thing very often that's the most wonderful thing in the, in the piece that you're doing. So it's not that you can precisely predict exactly how sound is going to wind up in the film when you're in pre-production. But I still think it's important to start with a plan sure. that then you can that then you can riff off of. Yeah, you can riff off of and and uh, deviate from when it's appropriate to. Well, that that was my list of questions. Do you have any any further any, any final thoughts for us? Oh, well, uh, go sound. <laughs> <laughs> well, you I remember when you won the Academy Award for The Incredibles. Uh, you got up and you you gave uh, what I thought was a very lovely. Uh, speech, uh, and it was, uh, I'm sure you remember it, but it was, you talked about the sound is not, it's, it's not, it's not a technician's thing. It is, although there is a technical aspect to it, uh, uh, certainly, but it is an art and, and there's a great deal of creativity and, and storytelling involved with it. And so, uh, you know, I just wanted to thank you for the work that you do, um, to spread that gospel and to get people to think more creatively about sound because, you know, as, a uh, uh, our old boss, George Lucas, used to say it is at least 50% of the motion picture experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's another odd thing about sound that uh, aside from composers and people who perform music, uh, anybody else who does anything in connection with sound is considered an engineer. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm not an engineer. Walter Murch is not an engineer. Skip Leavesay is not an engineer. Mm -hmm. you know, Gary Rydstrom is not an engineer. None of us have engineering degrees. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we know how to use tools to one degree or another, just like everybody else does. Everybody uses technology. Um, but uh, this notion that all sound people are technicians or engineers is, is baffling to me. I'm not sure how that notion got started. But when people refer, to, you know, I, I love engineers. I rever, revere and-, and uh, <laughs> They save us on a daily basis. They, 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 they <laughs> save us and they do miraculous things. Um, but whenever anybody refers to me as an engineer, uh, I'm a little insulted just because <laughs> clearly they don't know much about what I actually do. As what we as sound designers and sound mixers do is mostly- an artistic job. We're trying to figure out what sounds are going to work emotionally in a given situation. And I make uh, hundreds of artistic decisions about a sound before I ever present it to the director. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, an, an odd uh, yoke that we, <laughs> we sound people wear that we, we tend to be thought of as, as engineers and technicians. And, um, yeah, a lot of people have uh, have uh, thanked me for making that little political uh, speech, if you without want to call doubt, it political, at the Academy Awards. I also just want to give a, a, a shout out. You know, you talked about the the luckiest phone call you ever made to, to Walter Murch at the very beginning of your career, and I, it, this may not be something a lot of people know about you, but you do a fantastic job with mentoring, uh, you know, up and coming sound artists, and there are a lot of of, of sound designers and mixers working today, uh, enjoying very successful careers who started off as your apprentice. Uh, and I think that's just fantastic. You've been very generous, uh, with, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, taking people on at Skywalker Sound. And, and I think that's a great part of your legacy. Well, thanks. You know, Walter Murch and Ben Burt and Alan Splett were all very generous to me when I was getting started. And so I think it's my, my duty to, to continue in that tradition. Well, that's, uh, that's our conversation with Randy Tom. We're uh, wrapping up the Dolby Institute here at Skywalker Sound. Thanks for taking the time, Randy. You're welcome. Welcome.